Crystal Bear, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I'm losing my job today, Eric. Any of you willing to admit you've had an argument over texting? Um, can be pretty interesting. As we talk about conflict today, let's, uh, let's talk about things that escalate conflict, escalate arguments. Just throw it out there. What, what comes to mind if you think of what escalates an argument? Name calling. Yeah, that's not usually helpful. Yeah, what else escalates an argument? Bullying? Okay, yes. Always or never. She's learning from her father who made that mistake recently. Yes, uh, <clears throat> what else? Sarcasm, not a helpful thing. What else escalates an argument? Anger. What did you say, Caleb? Volume. Volume, yes. Yelling really loud is probably not helpful for an argument. Right? Oh, it's fun with a microphone. Ah, uh, what else escalates an argument? Huh? Emotions, okay. Let's talk about what um, solves arguments. What, what helps make those arguments um, come to a conclusion? And, and unity. Gentle words, okay? <laughs> Letting the other person have what they want. Yes, that, that usually works. Yeah? Admitting you were wrong. wrong. Okay, very good. Confession. Yes. What else? Apologizing, right, yes, um, saying you're sorry. So we've been talking about this, this conflict with another person and how to solve these. Today we're talking about a little bit more about when, the, when we are the one who offended the person. The first week we talked about the path to peace is paved with empathy. Uh, Pastor Steve reminded us of, of looking at it from the other person's perspective. Um, if you want to go ahead, one slide, Penny. And then the, the week after that, we said forgiveness is the me vehicle to move you down the path. Oh, I'm two slides ahead of you. Sorry, Penny. Um, forgiveness, last week, P Pastor Steve talked about forgiveness being the path to peace. This week conversation or confrontation. Now, on face value, that's easy, right? Well, of course, conversation, that's a better thing. But uh, so many of us are tempted to do that confrontation when we have an issue with somebody. So let's look at God's Word. Matthew 18, 15 says this. If you're following along in your worship folder and the outline, I encourage you to Jot down some notes because I'm sure you or someone you know will need this message. Uh, Matthew 18, 15, if your brother or sister sins against you, share it as a prayer request at your next small group meeting. That's what we're tempted to do. That's not what the Bible says. Uh, that's what we're tempted to do, though. We tell our small group, would you pray for my boss? He's really a pain in the neck. And he really needs to change his attitude. Will you please pray for him? Or if your brother or sister sins against you, vaguely post about it on social media. Some of us have been tempted to do this. Uh, you know, you might post on your, on your social media, um, learned this week never to enter the boss's office. I'm just leaving it at that. Uh, or, or learned this week that neighbors sure are fun after a nice argument with the neighbors. Or, uh, you know, learned, learned this week, just avoid in-laws at all cost. You know, those kinds of vague statements are not necessarily the best thing to do. How about this, Matthew 18, 15, if your brother or sister sins against you, eat all the ice cream you want because Ben and Jerry are the only friends you have left. 
Um, some of you, that's your default when you have conflict. You just go to food, ignore the conflict, ignore the issue, food will be my solution. That's not so good either. What does Matthew 18, 15 actually say? It says, if your brother or sister sins against you, go. Go to them. Don't go to a bunch of other people. That's what we're tempted to do. We're tempted to talk to a bunch of other people. I have done it. You have done it. We talk to everybody else about the problem person except actually talking to the person. What is that called when we do that? Gossip. It's called gossip. It's also called triangling. If you try to get somebody else involved and you're trying to get them on your side and you might even try to convince them to go talk to that horrible person for you and get some sense into them, it's not a good thing. There were two farmers who had some issues with each other and they went to court to try to resolve their differences. Then judge said they needed to try mediation first and they needed to do it in good faith. So the mediator um, couldn't get either man to talk. And after 10 minutes or so, he went back to the judge. And the judge got a bit annoyed with the farmers and told, told the farmers to try again. But still, neither of the farmers would say anything. So on returning to the courthouse, the judge asked one of the farmers, why, why do you refuse to talk to each other? And the one farmer said, I have no problem talking to him, but you were very clear that we had to negotiate in good faith. And I'm not sure how we're supposed to do that because I'm a Lutheran and he's a Baptist. Sometimes we use every excuse possible to not talk to the person and not to resolve the conflict. We don't want to meet face to face. I don't know how many times people have come to me with somebody's issue, with some conflict, and I say, yeah, have you talked to them? No, no, I can't do that. Then I can't help you. You need to go and talk to them first. So today we're going to talk about when we should go, why we should go, and how we should go. Matthew 5 also talks about this. Matthew 18 talks about conflict resolution, and Matthew 5 talks about it. Matthew 5 talks about it a little bit different way. It says, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has sinned against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. So if you're offering your gift and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, uh-oh, this time you're the problem maker. In Matthew 18, they're the problem maker. In this scenario, in Matthew 5, you're the problem maker. You know what, though? Both passages, it says we're to go. We're to go to the person and solve it. So when are we to go? As soon as you realize you have a conflict with someone. God wants us to go to them. He wants us to resolve it. And isn't this interesting? As in this passage, he's, he's wanting us, you know, we come to the altar, we have our gift to resolve our sin, to offer a gift to God. In the Old Testament, they brought doves and lambs and all that sort of stuff. And we're supposed to offer our gift to God. And, and God says, no, wait, before you make it right with me, I want you to make it right with this person you have a conflict with. So in real life, we might play it out in this way. If you're taking your wife out, husbands, to a great restaurant on a Friday night, you're taking them to Victoria's, and, and you remember as you're walking in the door, you had a big argument with your father-in-law that week or earlier in the month. If we're following this passage, we would say, honey, I, I really need to go and call your dad. I think we're going to have a better night out if I have this conversation. And your wife would probably go, yes, you are right. We're going to have a lot better night if you go and solve that first. Because uh, she knows there's that conflict between you. God wants us to resolve those conflicts. He doesn't want it just right with him, but he wants it right with 
others as well as we live out our relationship with him. So before making things right with God, we make things right with others. Matthew 5, 23, and therefore, remember that your brother or sister has something against you. It's your fault he calls us to go. Maybe you're at church trying to make things right with God, but God is saying to you, you know what, you have a lot of conflict with this person or that person, and you're having a hard time connecting with me because you haven't resolved it, those relationships first. First go and be reconciled to them, Matthew 5, 24 says. First go to them. So when you've been wronged, when somebody's sinned against you, our job is to go, to make the first step. But also, when you've wronged someone, when we have been the instigator of the wrong, Matthew 5 says, go, take the first step. Be reconciled, Matthew 5, 24 says. Some of you have grown up in divorce situations. And you know what it's like every time there's a wedding, every time there's a big anniversary or family reunion, there's not peace. You're like, ah, mom and dad are both going to be there, and it is not fun. God's saying, be reconciled. So you can be in the same room together. So you can have that peace that comes from God in those relationships as well. So when do we do this? As soon as we know there's a problem, how do we do it? We do it, we make it right by confessing your wrong. You confess what you've said, and some of you said that when we were brainstorming at the beginning. You confess what you did wrong. You don't have to confess every sin that ever existed in your life. You don't have to hash the entire experience. You just say, I did this wrong, this was my part, and I'm responsible for it, and I'm sorry. When you've been wronged, you take the first step. You offer forgiveness, even if they haven't confessed, even if they haven't admitted their sin. You offer forgiveness to them. You take the first step in making it right again. And then when you've wronged, when you've been the one who made the initial problem, you take the first step. You repent. You admit you're part of the problem. And what does repentance look like? How does that play out? It's taking full responsibility for your wrong. You're not, you're not explaining it away. It's not, it's not saying, well, this or that. It's, it's making no excuses for your behavior. So many people like to make the excuses, right? Oh, I was so tired. I was so stressed. The kids were driving me crazy. Don't make excuses. We just admit, I messed up. This is what I did wrong, and I'm sorry. And then we lay out a plan for change. You know, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to pray every day that God would hold my tongue, that God would shape me and mold me and make me more patient, and that I would would work to make this uh, a great relationship again. So reconciliation requires... Turning a confrontation into a conversation. Turning a confrontation into a conversation. None of us are good at conflict, right? We like to say, oh, I'm not good at conflict. I can't talk to him face to face. Nobody's good at conflict. (laughs) None of us like it. But God says, go to that person. And how do we go? We go immediately, God's word says. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. We go to immediately. We go as soon as we know there's an issue. We go directly. We don't triangle. We don't gossip. We don't talk to everybody else about it. But we go directly to them and we do what we can with what we have control of to make the relationship right. And then we go humbly. This is so powerful. Some of you mentioned this in our brainstorming. You go humbly, without an attitude, 
without arrogance, without arguing back and forth, without debating, without bringing up all the issues from the past, without bringing up every detail of the situation. You just go humbly and you take responsibility for your part and you say, I'm sorry. There was a rich man and, and his wife who were trying to get through their divorce and uh, there was lots and lots of months of mediation and, and uh, the, the husband finally gave up. He just like, have the car, have the house, have the boat, have the cottage, you can have it all. And uh, the wife looks at the mediator and said, I wish you would listen to me like he listens to you. There's power in humility. There's power in um, coming together and not fighting to win. You know, I told um, someone recently, you can either be right or you can either be happy. It's up to you. Um, there's so much power when we come humbly and uh, come with empathy. You know, what, what, what would it have been like if Jesus chose to just, you know, argue about our sin. I would love to die on the cross for those people, but they are so full of it. They have such attitudes. Man, every single day they just sin over and over and over again. It drives me crazy. You know, I'll die for them one day when they come back to me and say they're sorry. When they come to me and admit what they did wrong. When they come to me and finally try to make this relationship right, then I will forgive their sins. No, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus knows our arrogance. Jesus knows our pride. Jesus knows our lack of repentance for our daily sin. And yet he forgives us anyway. May we model that perfect forgiveness that God gives us to those around us. Making peace with others clears our path to peace with God. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love, your forgiveness, your grace for us. Um, you call us to go whether somebody else sinned against us or uh, if we've been the one who sinned against someone else. You call us to go. You call us to approach them with humility, forgiveness, with uh, responsibility for our part of the problem. And we thank you, Lord, for not keeping accounts of our sin. We thank you, Lord, for coming uh, to us and forgiving us even when we're um, unrepentant, uh, even when we're arrogant, even when we're prideful, even when we're careless with your grace. You said, those who have faith in you will receive eternal life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Not live a perfect life, but belief in you, trust in you. And for that, we're thankful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.